Yes, I'm Frédéric Guichard, and I have to accept that this meeting is recorded. Done. Um, and it's a pleasure for me to uh, introduce our speaker uh, today for the um, QLS uh, Kanban seminar, uh, Professor Antoine Allard um, from Université Laval. Um, Professor Allard is, um, has received his PhD in physics from Université Laval uh, in 2014, and he went on then to uh, for a postdoc in beautiful Barcelona, spent a few years there, um, and then came back to um, to Université Laval to take his position so that he, uh, he has started in 2018. I would say that um, a, a very strong thread um, in his research is complex system sciences. And I was checking, I was discussing with him. He, I think he set foot in a, all the major hubs in complex system science, at least in North America. And so Barcelona would be an additional one uh, from just summer schools in the Santa Fe Institute to his involvement uh, with the complex system, uh, the complex system center in Vermont um, and organizing, being uh, taking a lead role in centers at Universidad de Valle, so the Dinamica Research Lab that he's a uh, co-director of and his involvement also with the uh, CIMUR, uh, which is a mathematical modeling uh, research center at Universidad de Valle. Um, so working complex systems and on complex, on, on, on network dynamics, today is gonna talk to us about epidemiology. So uh, thank you, Antoine, and over to you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for the uh, for the invitation. I'm pretty happy to uh, meeting all of you. Uh, I heard about the program before, but this is the first time that I kind of get in touch with all of you. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, what I like to do in my, this, so this is gonna be like, I'm gonna, do the presentation, but uh, I really like it when things are more interactive. So please, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, to interrupt. Uh, I won't be monitoring the chat, so if you uh, don't, feel free to just you know uh, say my name and ask your question. That's no problem. Also, this is uh, in this format. This is the first time I'm giving this talk, so I, I wasn't sure how about the length. So I expect this talk to be rather on the short side than on the long side. So we are, we'll have time. So if you inter interrupt me, then there's no problem. I'm pretty sure we'll have time to cover everything. So, um, so uh, let's go. So I, uh, I don't think I need to convince you that the COVID-19 pandemic has been pretty terrible on so many aspects. Uh, maybe one interesting thing, maybe one positive thing that uh, came out of it is that it brought to the public eye the role that mathematical, mathematical models can play in infectious disease, uh, infectious disease epidemiology. So for instance, we've seen models either like at, at work, either to generate forecasts, to estimate the effectiveness of uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions. So think about the mask, think about lockdowns and stuff like that are also see mathematical models at uh, work to help us understand the underlying factors that can influence uh, the spread of the virus. So here I'm just uh, showing a few images just to illustrate my point. So for instance, if you go to the Government Canada webpage and you see this, this, this webpage, mathematical modeling of COVID-19, and then you see there's a section called why modeling is important. And this is where you have access to all the reports where they show the kind of forecast they made using mathematical models. Um, there's also many, we've seen, I mean, I've seen many articles in the newspapers, for instance, in Le Devoir, in The Guardian, where they would talk about details and I'd say uh, fairly advanced, talking about fairly advanced concepts of mathematical, mathematical models. So I think this is something that people were not that much aware of before the pandemic and maybe one of the very few positive aspects of it. And another understanding, uh, another interesting uh, observation is that in 2020, four and at least uh, actually one of your colleagues, uh, four mathematical modelers were selected as 2020 scientists of the year by uh, Radio Canada. So again, uh, like another way that people in the public got to be uh, to become more uh, knowledgeable about mathematical models and epidemiology. So uh, I must say that the pandemic has been a revelation to me uh, as well. So uh, I've got a fair background in mathematical modeling and epidemiology. I did the, 
my master was in collaboration with people at the BC CDC, so the Center for the Disease Control in Vancouver. But since the beginning of my graduate studies, I've been studying epidemi epidemiological models, but from a rather theoretical perspective. So, and if I can be honest with you, like I considered these models to be toys that I was playing with. And I thought that they were kind of, they were very interesting, but I thought they were kind of too theoretical to be very useful in the real world. And if I can be even more honest with you, I was thinking maybe in the fall 2019 that perhaps this kind of a research interest would uh, you know, slowly go away and I would be focusing on other type of dynamics in complex systems. But then January 2020 came, came along and everything changed. So, I mean, at the end of the very end of uh, December 2019, we started to hear about this pneumonia in China. And every day, every week, they would have like new news about this new virus. And a friend of mine, a collaborator of mine, the high belt fine, I'm gonna mention him at the end of the, the talk, came to visit. And he was like, So have you heard about this? Yes, okay. And we started talking, and then we realized that uh, actually many like we realized that there was many intuition that we could obtain from the models we were playing with could apply to what was happening now. And we realized that the work that we had done was less theoretical than we thought previously. So this basically re-sparked my interest in this topic and monopolized a large part of my it's a research bandwidth over the past two years. So in the seminar, what I want to do is to give you a taste of that journey. So I want to about, talk about math mathematical modeling and epidemiology. And I'll cover, let's say, four main topics. So the first one, I want to talk about basic, uh, basic epidemiological models. So what, what the, do people in general think about when they think about uh, epidemiological models? Then I want to talk about how COVID-19 challenge, some of the assumptions that these models make. Then I want to introduce some basic concepts of what we call contact network epidemiology, and then explain how uh, COVID-19 allowed complex network epidemiology to shine and what we've been able to learn from it. Okay, so the basic epidemiological models, they've been around uh, maybe for almost 100 years now. Uh, they've been, uh, I think the first introduction of these kind of models were by uh, Kermack and McKendrick and around the, the late uh, 20, uh, 1920s. And basically these models make a bunch of assumptions like, in, like any other models. And I divided them into two categories. So the first one is say, the epidem epidemiological assumptions and the other ones are the structural ones. So for the epidemiology, well, these kind of models will either assume that the disease results in either a complete immunity or death. So this will be for the SIR dynamics. Or they will assume that the disease is not fatal, so people don't die from it, and it conveys no immunity. And this will be the SIS dynamics. Uh, these models also assume that all individuals are equally susceptible. So I'm gonna talk a bit about this as well. And from the structural as, uh, assumptions, let's say, first we assume that the disease is transmitted in a closed population. So that means that for instance, there's no like importation of cases. So there's no people like traveling to a new city and then bringing the disease with them, except for the first person that brings it. Then they assume that the contacts among the, the individuals are made according to the love mass action and that the population is large enough to justify a deterministic analysis. So basically that you can write down uh, differential equations and then you solve to uh, see how the, whether or not, for instance, there is an epidemic wave or not. So the first model I want to discuss with you is uh, what we call the SIS dynamics. So SIS stands for susceptible, infected and susceptible. And this is the case where the disease is not fatal and it conveys no immunity. So basically, individual in the population will be split into two states. So either they are susceptible to the disease, so they can catch it, or they are infected and can transmit it. So S and I here are the fraction of the population that are in either of the two categories. 
And then the, the model with which we, what we call the mass action assumption is saying that the susceptible and the infected individual will come into contact at a rate proportional to the product of the population of the both fractions. Okay, so they will uh, so the susceptible will get infected at a rate that is uh, exactly equal to in this case beta times s times i. And uh, if you if you remember your chemistry class, this is the kind of assumption we make when we want to uh, model uh, chemical reactions. So we assume that there's no structure, and then the molecules are, for instance, in a solution. They move around and they come into contact uh, randomly, but without any structure. So this is the way. So basically, the rate beta s i is the rate at which the susceptible become infected. And then they recover from the disease at a rate alpha i here and go back to the susceptible. So this is what I mean. The fact that there's a closed loop here is what we mean by the fact that it conveys, it's not fatal and it conveys no mutant. So we can write down the differential equations for this model. And these are simple enough that we can actually solve for a trajectory. So here would be the number, the fraction of um, infected individual over time. And what we find actually when we analyze these equations is that in this case, the dynamics will either, like the dynamic will either die down. So the number of cases will go to zero. or it will settle to uh, some equilibrium where there's a lot, like there's the same, the rates at which people get infected and at which people recover becomes equal. And then you always have the same fraction of the people in the population that gets infected over time. So, um, Oops, sorry about that. So for instance, here I'm plotting the, this equation for uh, i and s, uh, because i here is just one minus i. And we see that when this parameter r not here is below one, then even though you had like 10% of people infected at the beginning, the number of infection just goes down expansion, exponentially and reaches zero at some point. Whereas when r, r not is below one, then we see that even though you start with a very, so this is uh, these fraction S and I over time. So even though you start with a very, very small fraction of infected individuals, then the number of cases will grow until it reaches this equilibrium value. So perhaps you've, you probably have heard about r not. It's been, uh, again, this is a kind of things that have been in the news. Uh, there was article, for instance, in the Atlantic on this. And this is what we call the basic reproduction number. So it's, a, it's in this case, it's a ratio of these parameters. And the interpretation of this number is it's the expected number of secondary cases that will be directly caused by one case in an otherwise fully susceptible population. So basically what it says is one infected individual will on average infect r not people and themselves will infect r not people and so on. And so this is why when, when this is below one, you see that on average, you will, people will infect less than one person. So basically the number of infected individual will go down. Whereas when it's below, uh, above one, sorry, you see that you, you will have this exponential uh, growth in the number of cases. So this is for the SIS uh, dynamics. The other important model is the other one I mentioned before, which is the SIR which stands for susceptible infected recovered. So in this case, the disease will result in either complete immunity or death. So what that means is instead of having this, this loop that goes back from the infected to the susceptible, then people, when they recover, when they die, they go to this other compartment R here and they don't contribute more to the dynamic. So here I'm introducing a new quantity R, which is a fraction of a patient having recovered from the disease. And again, the, we, uh, this, this approach assumes that uh, susceptible and infected individuals come into contact at a rate proportional to SI, which is what I call the mass action assumption. And again, we can write down uh, differential equations that we can solve um, either analytically or numerically. So um, in this case, Typically we won't, like the dynamics won't reach an equilibrium. It will at some point, like the number of infected people will, um, will go to zero. So there won't be new infections, but the question is whether or not we had a, an uh, like a wave on infection, or if we had like a very small outbreaks with a number of cases uh, growing, um, growing down or diminishing exponentially. So, um, 
so the, these are the two um, examples, uh, the two scenarios I, uh, I put here. So in this case, you see like, the, so do you see my uh, mouse pointer? Because I'm going to be using it a lot. Yes. OK, great. So here, we're in a case where R0, I'm going to talk about it later, but the R0 again is larger than one. So what we see is that we've got, we're starting with a very small fraction of uh, infected individual. And we see that we have this epidemi uh, epidemic wave that then goes down when actually the number of susceptibles go down. So in this case, the disease has almost infected everybody. And this is why the waves goes down. And we can see this when you look at I, uh, um, when we look at how R, R, R is uh, almost reaches one here. When R naught is below one, then we see that even though in this case, again, um, we started with about 10% of uh, infected individuals, like they don't, they, they recover faster than they can infect other people. So then we don't have like a wave that grows and then decreases. We have only like one exponential uh, decrease um, which means that we only the disease has only infected like a small fraction of the population. So the value at which this R curve settles, so what I'm going to note R infinity, which is the total number, the total fraction of people or the population that will have been infected at some point, uh, can be solved by solving this uh, uh, this equation here. So I'm insisting on it because it will come back at some point in this presentation. So I'm, at some point I will mention it. So just that you have it in mind. Again, we have R0 acting as the basic representation number. And as I said, there will be an epidemic wave if R0 is greater than one. Otherwise the outbreak will die out without having this exponential increase in cases. And um, one thing that is uh, actually nice from these models is that you see when herd immunity is attained. So if this fraction of, the pe of people have been somehow immunized, then this is enough to break the, the epidemic wave and to make the outbreak decrease exponentially. So when at the very beginning of the, of the pandemic, when we talk about the fact that if we had a vaccine, we would need to have people like about 60% of our population vaccinated, this was, this number was attained by a more complicated calculation, but the gist of it, like the, the idea was basically just using this equation. So for instance, R0 at the beginning for the first, uh, the first variant of, well, the first, the, the original, um, uh, the original virus, R0 was below, was between two and three. So let's say, so let's say it's three. Then you see that you would need to, in, uh, immunize about 66% of the population for uh, the, to prevent any other, any epidemic wave. So this is where this number came from, more or less. Obviously people now do more uh, complicated calculations, but if, I mean, this is enough to understand more or less the idea. So these are the two basic epidemiological models. I uh, uh, just wanna point out that when people use them in real life, they are more complicated than this. I'm giving you here th three examples. One used by uh, people at, uh, in Austin, in Texas. So this model was used to model uh, COVID-19. This one here was used to model Ebola virus disease. And this one was used to model treatments of uh, tuberculosis transmission. Okay, sorry, I think I was, uh, I've been silenced. <laughs> sorry, um, I accidentally hit. I no, that's on. fine. No, we're not. <laughs> um, so yes, um, so I'm just showing this to you that, just so, so you know that like real model, like people, models that people use in general are more complicated than this, but still like the basic ingredients are the same. So if you understand like the, the general idea of these two models, then you can understand a lot of uh, the models that are used uh, in the concrete applications. So I said, so this is for the, this is it for the basic epidemiological models. So I said that some of their assumptions were challenged by COVID-19. So here I'm putting again, all the assumptions I mentioned a few slides uh, back. And the two most important uh, assumptions that are challenged by COVID-19 are these two. So the fact that contacts occur according to the love max action. So I'm gonna explain why 
this is an assumption that is uh, kind of not treated very well by COVID-19. And the other one is that the population is large enough to justify a uh, deterministic analysis. So first assumption here. So basically, um, so the fact that contacts occur according to the law mass action. So basically what behind this assumption, there's the fact that in these models, if R naught is three, then R 2.6 or whatever, then everybody that gets the disease will infect more or less uh, the value of R naught. So let's say, let's say three or 2.6. So if you look at, if you simulate these, these dynamics and you look at how, how many people each new case is infected, then and you draw the distribution, you'll get something that looks like a Poisson distribution. So you have an average here, which is R0, but you see that the distribution is very well localized near the, uh, the, the value of R0. And this is something, for instance, that is quite typical with the flu. So seasonal flu behaves this way. So this is why these kind of models uh, are used a lot in uh, to to uh, to simulate the propagation of the uh, of the flu, for instance. What became clear at the very beginning of the the pandemic of the even even before it was uh, called a pandemic is that, and I'm showing it here, is that about 10% of the infected people would would cause about 80% of the new cases. So we found that people realized pretty quickly that. Um, there was the distribution of secondary infection was very skewed, and that most of the most of the dynamics of this transmission dynamics was driven by what we call super spreading events. So typically, super spreading events are um, this kind of distribution are a model I, a model with uh, using negative binomial distribution, and here I'm showing the same the distribution of negative binomial, uh, the same distribution sorry, the negative binomial distribution with the same average value as the Poisson. But where we see that, it's true that a lot of people won't, here we see that a lot of people won't transmit the disease, but then a few of them will transmit the disease to a lot of people. And this is what, this is what we call super spreading event. So in the case of, the, of COVID-19, as I wrote here, we've seen that the outbreaks were not shaped are driven by the average individual, but was rather driven by a minority of super spreader, super spreading events. So this is the first challenge assumption. The other one is the fact that the population is large enough to justify a deterministic analysis. And I mean, this is, this is true also for the flu. I mean, usually when, um, but I, what I wanna say about this before is that this is, a uh, this is true once the outbreak, the outbreak has taken, uh, taken up. But at the very early stage, the outcome of a new outbreak, so if you introduce a new case in, uh, I don't know, a meatpacking plant or a new, a new case in a nursing home or in a school, then at the early stage, the outcome of the outbreak will depend on stochastic events. And this is true for any disease. Uh, it's true for the flu as well, but because, um, COVID-19 is driven by super spreading events, then this has a very strong impact. So what does that mean is that for, uh, in many cases, so these are uh, simulations of the number of infections as a, as a function of the generation. So a generation here is, let's say generation zero would be the first person who's got it. The person we, we call this person patient zero. Then the first generation would be the people that got infected from patient zero. Then generation two would be the person, the people that were infected by people from the generation one and so on. And these are about 10,000 simulations using numbers, um, real, realistic parameters for COVID-19. And we see that a lot of outbreaks die out by themselves. So just by stochastic, uh, just by stochasticity, these outbreaks tend to die out by themselves. So, um, so yeah, as I was saying, so this is also true for the flu, but the fact that COVID-19 is driven by super uh, spreading events, it means that a lot of them will die out, but once in a while, there will be like a huge outbreak somewhere. And we've seen this as well in the pandemic, for instance, uh, um, uh, I don't know, for instance, in meat, meat packing plants in the United States. So 
there were like, people surveyed all the, these large plants and you realize that for instance and sometimes they would have like an, only a few cases but then in other ones uh, like 60 percent of the workforce would get infected so if we want to model this COVID-19, and especially the early stage of it, then it's very important to use a formalism that will have this part of uh, stochasticity in it. So when we go back to the, um, these basic epidemiological models, because, we make, because they are deterministic models and we know that we won't be able to capture the diversity in uh, this outbreak size. So, um, so this is true for COVID-19, but this was something true as well that I've been observed for the SARS epidemic. So I don't know if you remember SARS. I don't know how many people here were old enough to remember what happened in 2003. But um, for instance, uh, a good anecdote, I think, you know, if I recall cor correctly, uh, two people were in Hong Kong and uh, they, I think they stayed at the same hotel and got infected there. And one of this person flew back to Toronto and another one flew back to Vancouver. And what happened is in Vancouver, the, the, I think it was a man, he, uh, he got sick, but while he was, he, were, he, he was in a cabin outside of the city. So he infected a few people, but because he was fairly uh, uh, isolated, then it, it, he, he didn't spark like a large number, like epidem an epidemic in, uh, in Vancouver. Whereas the person who flew to Toronto lived in a multi-generational household, had a lot of contacts. And then in Toronto, we had a major epidemic that was uh, on the news, national news, like for, uh, I don't remember how many weeks, but it was a, a big story at the time. So you see that the conditions where the, where the around where the, the disease is introduced will uh, impact a lot the, the let's say the, um, the fate of the outbreak and, this is, and some, it's even more important when we think about COVID-19. So this is why I was, I was saying that we'll, be, we'll need to, uh, if we want to model this properly, we'll need to use a formalism that can uh, take into account these kind of statistic effects. So this brings me to my uh, third point, what we call contact network epidemiology. And so, um, if I want to simplify things, contact network epidemiology is simply the idea of taking into account the contact network between individuals uh, into the models. So basically, we assume that people here, for example, you get, the, you get this figure, people are uh, connected to one another. And then an infectious disease will only be transmitted from one infected individual to their susceptible neighbors through the contact network. So you don't have access to everybody in the population, you only can infect people that are that have some contact with you. So this is, I mean, this is kind of something that looks, uh, uh, it's not such a big surprise here, but what's quite interesting with this framework is that you realize quickly that the structure of the contact network would then shape the spreading dynamics. So then if we study the structure of this contact network, we can say something about the way like, uh, how the disease will spread and evolve. So what we do when we do this, we use a mathematical ab abstraction. So we will assume that the individual here will be nodes or vertices, that potential disease causing contacts between two individuals will be represented by links or edges, and that the, a network or a graph will represent the contact network in a population. So, uh, here I'm, uh, I'm showing a, a little cartoon of a network and let's say, so how does that work? Let's say that this node here, so all the nodes are green, are susceptible and let's say that this one has been infected. So this would be our patient zero. And when what happens is that this, this person will infect maybe one of their neighbors, maybe will infect another one. And at some point we'll recover from the disease. But while the other here, the other neighbors that were infected will maybe infect some of their neighbors and that the disease will spread along the edges or the links of the network. Okay, so this is the main idea behind uh, contact network epidemiology. Now there's a tool that we can use, which is called, or which, which is called epidemic percussion networks. And so in the previous slide, what I've shown you like with the little animation is that you'll have a stochastic process that will take place 
on the network, on the contact network, and that will produce an outcome. So basically what you need to do then is uh, repeat the same experience many times because it is a stochastic process to get the distribution over all the possible outcomes. What we do when we use the tool of EPNs here is that we will uh, consider an ensemble of random networks that will encode all the possible outcomes. So basically, if I use, if I go back to this network, here all the links are um, represent potential disease contact, con uh, potential disease causing contact. So that means that if these two nodes are connected and one of them gets infected, then perhaps the disease will be transmitted along this link. What we do in EPN is that we make a decision. We say, well, no, you know, if this node gets becomes infected, then it will infect all the nodes that can be reached through these edges. So we take one network and then we build an ensemble of directed um, random networks that will encode all the possible uh, outcome of the dynamics. So basically we've got, we exchange one stochastic process with another, but what becomes nice is that we, now all the dynamics is encoded in the structure. So if we study the structure itself, then we're able to say something about this, uh, the splitting dynamics. So how do we study this? Uh, we study this using a tool that is called probability generating functions. So, um, I, I won't get too much into the details, but I just wanted to uh, mention a few properties so that you understand how we can then play with uh, and deal with the equations. So a uh, probability generating function is simply a, a formal power series whose coefficients, here the an, are a probability mass function. So basically when we write down this PGF, what we, what we have in mind is it's, it's the probability of having zero, plus the probability of having x1, uh, a1, uh, sorry, plus the probability a1 of having one, then the probability of having two, which is a2 times x squared and so on. And why do we use these tools is that it makes it very easy to manipulate uh, probability distributions. So for instance, it's quite straightforward to compute the moments. So the, it's the zeroth moment, which is the normalization is only, it's obtained by evaluating degenerating functions to one, but then by taking successive derivative, we can compute all the other moments, and since here the, the average value, but then all the higher order moments. Um, in this formalism, sometimes we are able to compute the PGF without knowing what the distribution that it generates is. So then what we can do is retrieve from the PGF the probability mass function that it supports. And this is obtained again by a successive derivations. Or if we use, if you know um, the Cauchy integral theorem, then we can transform this into an integral. And this then takes the shape of uh, uh, an inverse uh, Fourier transform. Also, it's pretty, and why we use this is because it's very, makes it very easy to then combine different stochastic experiments. So for instance, if we're interested in looking at the distribution of the sum of a fixed number of variables that are drawn independently, for instance, if we, 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 let's say we draw two numbers from this distribution and we're interested in the sum, then the, the distribution of this sum will be distributed according to this generating function, which is simply the original distribution, uh, the generating function uh, elevated to the power of two. This is true for any value. So let's say we want to sum 10 um, uh, random variables that are drawn from the distribution A here, then this would be just, the distribution would be generated by this generating function that is simply equal to um, AX to the power of P. Then if we were interested in summing uh, a, a number of uh, of variables, but that this number is also drawn from the same distribution, then we would get this, and this simply corresponds to a to, um, uh, to a composition of the uh, of the PGF here. So I, I don't, I, don't I've, I mean, I know that people are from different backgrounds. I don't know if you've played with this uh, in your life or in your, or you've seen it in class. So, but 
and I don't need you to understand everything, but what I want to convey here is simply that this a quite simple tool that's quite useful to look at all the ways you can combine numbers. And this is what we will, this is this, this is this priority that we will uh, take advantage of to then uh, apply it to the studying um, spring dynamics. So then what I call the PGF formalism, is the formalism that we're gonna be using. Um, so first it assume a very, very large population Okay, I'm not gonna get into the details, but we've, there's a way to neglect some finite size effects, even though, the, even though the outbreaks can be finite, but just keep in mind. So first we'll, uh, we'll say that patient zero. So patient zero would be the first node that was read in my network. So the first person that gets the disease will cause K secondary infections will pro with priority PK. So uh, if you're, if you know about uh, network science, then this would be the degree distribution of the APN. So we'll define this PGF, uh, G naught, that will be simply the polynomial so with whose coefficients are this distribution PK. And then we'll ask ourselves, well, let's say that I've reached a node by following one edge. So I, I, I like I took a link at random and then I followed it in one direction and I reach a node and I'm asking how many other people can you infect? So let's say like, so in other words, if I infected the node by following one link, how many other people can it infect? And so this is what we call the excess degree. And this will be distributed according to this distribution here. So basically it's not PK, it's K times PK if you want. So the idea is that if I have, uh, if if I uh, if my my degrees, if my k is equal to ten, then there are ten links that can lead to me. Whereas if I would have only one link, then there's only one link. So basically, this is why this proportionality here appears, and we'll need this distribution as well. So we'll define this uh, PGF G one that uh, looks like this, and that can be obtained from G zero or G naught by simply by a uh, Differentiating, differentiating the, uh, the PGF. Now in this formalism, uh, we can also, G, so the, the first moment of this distribution, of, so the first derivative of this PGF will give us the, the average number of new cases and new cases causes. And this is what we'll call uh, R naught here. And you see that in this case, it only depends on the first two moments of the uh, degree distribution of the APN. Now, in this formalism, we'll see that all outbreaks will eventually die out. So stochastic, the, the stochastic effect I was talking about when R0 is below one. But what's different in this case is that when R0 is greater than one, there, there could be an epidemic wave, but also some outbreaks will also die out just because of stochastic effects. So this is one way this formalism is different from the previous, previous ones I uh, have shown you. Now, what's the probability of, if let's say R0 is greater than one, what's the probability of, um, uh, of these outbreaks to die out? And there's a way to compute this using these, uh, again, by just, add, well, I won't get into the details, but then again, we can come up with this uh, equation for you. So you need to solve it, and then you can compute the size, like the final size of how many people will get infected in the epidemic wave. We can do something similar, but then instead of defining a probability u here, we use a, another generating function, and then we can get a functional equation that we need to solve, and then we can get from it h naught would be, which would be if there's no epidemic wave and got an, an outbreak that dies out by itself by stochastic effects then what's the size distribution of these outbreaks? So how many people will get infected in these small outbreaks? So this is an example where we obtain uh, generating functions without knowing what's the what the coefficients are. And this is an example where we use the uh, Fourier transform here that I was mentioning. Okay, so uh, this is the framework. Uh, I won't go too much into the details, but if you have questions, I'll be happy to, uh, to answer them. Uh, I mean, right now or at the end of the talk. 
So then I re, um, reached the fourth section of my of the seminar where I talk about I talk about what we've learned, what we can learn from using this kind of uh, formalism. So the first lesson is what we call the friendship paradox. So the friendship paradox is something that is, uh, I guess, widely known in sociology, and it's the idea that on average your friends have more friends than you do. Okay. And we can understand it from the network perspective, because if I pick a random individual, then it will have K friends or in fact K people with probability PK. But then if I look at their friends, so there are people that I reach by following a link, then they, have, they will have key friends with a probability proportional to K PK. So, let's, so I'm K times more likely, or I'm 10 times more likely to reach a friend that has 10 friends than I am to reach a friend that has only myself as a friend. So this is something fairly fairly known, but what's interesting here is that is, is that we realize we're using this framework that when the disease spreads along the links of a network, then it naturally oversamples individuals which are more likely to cause a, cause a larger number of secondary infections. So we see we see here exactly what's the effect of the network. So the, the, the disease won't spread the same way as it would have spread um, under the mass action assumption where this does not occur. So mass action assumption, there's not this friendship paradox effect. So related to that, the second lesson is the effect of super spreading events. So under the mass action uh, assumption, then we assume that um, everybody more or less infects the same number of people when they get infected themselves. And mathematically, this is encoded as I, we've seen a few slides ago as a Poisson distribution. But then if we uh, input a Poisson distribution into our formalism, then we find that the, the size of the, the epidemic at the end is exactly the same equations that we've seen if I go back here. So the question I mentioned that I highlighted at the beginning. So what's the, what does that mean is that um, whenever we have super spreading events, we know that the final size would not be the same one as the one that was, that would have the final size of the epidemic. So the no, final number of people that have been infected um, will not be the same as the one predicted by a formalism that is real, relying on the mass action assumption. So this is the second uh, lesson. The third lesson is that we need to go, uh, we need to look beyond R0 for over dispersed infectious diseases like COVID-19. So over dispersed here is synonym to a disease that is driven by super spreading events. So, um, I said that typically uh, super spreading events are uh, modeled using a negative binomial distribution. So this is the generating functions of it. And we see that this distribution has two parameters. So for instance, the Poisson distribution has only one, the average. In the case of the binomial, negative binomial, you've got two. So the first one is the average, so the R naught. And then there's another uh, parameter gamma here that is called the dispersion. And what we see when we apply this uh, into the formalism is that, okay, so here what I'm showing is the, the size of the epidemic. So how many people will get, will eventually get infected as a function of R0 and as a function of the dispersion parameter. So here it's, it's written K because typically people, it's a function of people use the same variable here I'm using gamma. So imagine that here it's gamma. And what we see here is that for a given value of R0, then if you increase the value of a gamma of the dispersion parameter, then you cross a lot of lines here, which means that for the same value of R0, then there's a, like the, the, the difference in the size of the outbreak or the epidemic size, if you will, can vary a lot, okay? And so, uh, and so what that means, and it, it goes, this is a figure from a paper that was written at the beginning of the pandemic. And at that time, people were very focusing on r because we are used to using only r to talk about how it's a dangerous is uh, a new, uh, like an emerging pathogen. But in this case, the idea was, was to say, well, if this is a disease that is as over dispersed as we think, 
then the question, once we know that R0 is above one, so once we know that there's a risk for uh, large scale propagation, then the question is not to know whether it's exactly 2.5 or 3.5, but that we should instead rather, that we should instead focus on how much heterogeneity there is. So um, how much, how over dispersed the disease is, because this is the dimensions where we cross more lines. Uh, yeah, this is the dimension where we cross more lines. So this, is one, this was like a third lesson that this kind of formalism was uh, allowing us to draw. A fourth lesson is the fact that COVID-19 is particularly over dispersed. So in this case, what we did is we applied this formalism, but with different diseases, uh, different pandemics that we, or of epidemics that we, um, uh, that occurred in the 2021st century. And what we see is that sometimes, so basically what you want to compare here is the red dots, which uh, we call Carmack McEnrick here, but it's basically the SIR model with the other symbols, which are different, which are this model. So the PGF formalism, but using different assumptions because there was some free, there was one free parameter that we needed to fix somehow. So we use different assumptions. The crosses here are the reported number of cases, so the size of uh, the outbreak or the size of the epidemic. And uh, in this case, uh, this was in uh, maybe mid 2020, uh, the dots here were different um, uh, reports about the number of cases in different communities on different settings. And what's important here is to see that, for instance, influenza for smallpox, uh, MERS and even from, from SARS, the, the two categories of models, so the, the ones from the PGF and the ones from the mass action models, were, were not necessarily saying the same thing, but it was kind of, they were kind of coherent with one another. In the case of COVID-19, we see that there's two different regimes that are totally different. So a regime where uh, basically the mass action works, and this was the number of cases reported in, I think it was a fishing vessel, so where people were very close and close quarter to one another. And another regime where it's more uh, like at the population level. So these were um, uh, cases, case counts reported for small villages, for uh, uh, different communities of a larger size where the social structure plays a role. And so, this figure tells us, and this, these results tell us that, um, as I said, COVID-19 is particularly over, particularly over dispersed, and that all the, the reflex that we could have, so maybe let me just walk back a little bit. So when I started working in this field it was before maybe two, 2006, um, people were very afraid of what they call pandemic influenza. So think about H1N1, for instance. And so many plans to, uh, to many, many plans to react to a pandemic were based on an hypothetical influenza virus. But what we, and I, I've said that influenza viruses behaves more or less like the mass action um, models. What we see here is that uh, COVID-19 behaves very differently. And what does this figure tell us is that plans that were prepared, prepared with the pandemic influenza in mind might, might fall short to contain the spread of COVID-19. And unfortunately, this is kind of the, what we've been witnessing for the past two years. So I've got only um, maybe two more lessons. So, uh, so I've been simply simplifying things a little bit. So when I talked about the EPNs, I've shown you this image where links would have a direction. So here, so maybe, maybe for instance, if this individual gets infected then it won't infect that one, but if this one gets infected, it will infect that one. And what I've shown you up to now was considering, uh, was ignoring, if you will, these, uh, these arrows. But we can generalize this approach to take into account the direction of the arrows. So then nodes will have two kinds of degrees. So instead of having like only one, and one number of contacts, they will have a number of contacts that could infect them. So links that point like to them. So for instance, in this case, the link points from that node to that one. So th this is what we call the in degree. And they will have 
also elderly, which would be the number of people that they will infect should they get infected. Okay, so in this case, this node, for instance, would have an in degree of zero and an out degree of one. And we comb this, these two different these two quantities as the risk and the spread of an, of, uh, an individual. So the risk then would be nodes with would correspond to the in degree. So how risky is it that I get the disease? And the spread is correct. Is uh, sorry, the spread corresponds to the out degree, which answer the questions. Um, if I get it. Am I in a position, will I be infecting a lot of people? And this difference, this difference is, uh, becomes important because you, you can uh, characterize people from uh, different, um, like you can characterize people, like you, you, can, you can fit them into the in different categories. So for instance, it would be the people that are low risk, but high spread. So these would be people that don't have a lot of contacts, but if they get it, they might infect a lot of people. People with uh, high risk, low spread. So think about, for instance, uh, cashiers at a grocery store. So they come into contact of, uh, of, uh, with a lot of people. So they are very likely to get it. But if they get it because they are behind, because they are wearing a mask or whatever, they are not likely to transmit it a lot because the contacts you have with the cashier at the grocery store is not that, uh, that close. And then you can think of people like nurses in the in an hospital where they come in contact with a lot of people that could become infected. And if they become infected, then it could infect a lot of other people. So people that we call high risk, high spread. So there's a bunch of um, conclusions that can be drawn from this, but I think one of the most important is that when it comes to how we do contact tracing. So contact tracing is the idea of if you know that somebody got infected, then you look at all the people this person has been in contact, contact with and you try to warn them so that they can isolate. Now, if for instance, we talk about this person, person with a low spread and we say, so since you've got your diagnosis, how many people have you been in contact with? Then you would be following the edges in that direction. And if this person is low spread, then you won't reach a lot of people and you're, you're likely to reach people that don't have a very high risk, uh, a very high spread themselves because the disease is uh, over dispersed. So there's, a, so there's a lot of people like this. Uh, sorry, yeah, a lot of people like this and a few like this. Then the idea is if instead, when you do your contact tracing, you say, you ask the person, so before you got symptoms, before you got your diagnostic, with whom were you in contact with? Or with whom you were in contact? So in this case, it would, it would mean like instead of going following the edges downstream, it would mean to go to follow the edges upstream. And then what we learn with the friendship paradox is that if you follow edges, then you reach, you oversample uh, nodes that have a higher degree. So in this case, you would oversample nodes that have a higher um, out degree. So nodes that have a higher spread. And then you're more likely to identify the people that are at the root of super spreading events. This is what we call backward contact tracing because we're following links in the uh, uh, upstream. And for instance, this is something that the Montreal Public Health has been doing for during the third wave. And I don't know if you remember, I, I was in Quebec City and the third, the third wave was pretty bad. But then we were looking at the statistics from Montreal and the wave was not that big. And what came out at the end of the wave is that uh, people in Montreal uh, invested a lot of resources into doing what we call backward contact tracing. So they were very good at identifying like this, the source of super spreading events, and then to isolate all the people, this person of this event, uh, all the person that this person was, all the contacts that this person had, or how many people attended for instance an event or stuff like this. So this is something, again, because we are taking into account a network structure, these are the kind of conclusions that uh, we can draw because we know that, the, because we found that there is this effect of uh, this idea of the friendship paradox on networks. Um, sixth and last lesson is that this framework allows us to assess the pandemic potential of an emerging disease. So again, if you, um, 
go back to uh, let's say January 2020. Um, so there was this new uh, this new this new pneumonia in China, and the question was, okay, so is it going to be like very bad over there? But is this what's the risk of it like reaching us? And um, and so early in, in 2020, people started, for instance, I'm citing here a paper by Julien Rio and Christian Althaus, and they were trying to estimate the parameters. So estimate what would be R not, for instance, estimate what would be uh, the, the dispersion coefficient from incidence data at the very early stage of the epidemic. And so, but, so this is something that uh, is fairly standard, but what we've been able to show is that not only does doing this uh, informs you about the risk of for an emergent pathogen to become uh, to spark become epidemic uh, to spark an epidemic or to spark a pandemic, but using data that uh, have been uh, that have been uh, obtained from the uh, the Ebola virus disease epidemic in Sierra Leone, so. These are very, very nice data where they had a lot of contact tracing data. So they know basically who got infected by whom. And also they have, an, uh, they have a very, a lot of data, a lot of details about the size of the different outbreaks. And so what we've been doing in this project is to try to infer uh, different parameters. So these one are not that important for this talk, but we focus on the dispersion, so what I call gamma and the R naught from the first 90 days of, the, of uh, the epidemic. And then look, how does, uh, how did the prediction of our, of the PGF formalism compared with, uh, so these would be the lines here, with the, the actual outbreak size distribution that was observed uh, on the field afterwards. And we see that the fit is quite good. So basically what this tells us is that not only doing this kind of uh, inference. So trying to infer these parameters from um, the first days of, uh, of, uh, of outbreaks helps us understand like what's the risk, but it also allows us to draw like a forecast about what kind of outbreak size we should expect. And so I have an idea of how, if this becomes pandemic, for instance, how, how will the disease invade uh, will the disease invade uh, different populations when it is inserted uh, uh, in, or imported through uh, travel, for instance? So this is what I wanted to talk to you about. In the end, uh, this was not as short as I expected. Um, so this, I mean, I've been working on all of these projects, but uh, you see this is not uh, a work that I've done alone. So this was uh, mainly uh, done with the collaboration of these, uh, uh, these collaborators and also many others. So Laurent Bert's friend and John Yuyan Young who are at the, the Vermont Complex System Center, Chris Moore at the Santa Fe Institute, Sam Scarpino is now at the Pandemic Prevention Institute uh, with the Rockefeller, uh, Rockefeller Foundation, and Ben Althaus who's now with, uh, working uh, with uh, Truveta, uh, Truveta in uh, Seattle. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I put the slide uh, available on my website and every time I mention a paper, it's clickable. So if you're interested in digging more into this topic or if, you have, like, if you're curious about it, then it's easy for you to uh, just uh, consult all the literature that I've been mentioning uh, during the talk. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the invitation and I'm happy to talk to discuss about this uh, and to answer your questions. Thanks, Antoine. Thanks for all six lessons. That was great. Do we have uh, questions for, uh, for Antoine? So I take it that everything was crystal clear. <laughs> no, no, no. Wait a second. It's going to be my turn. Can... <laughs> Good. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I was just wondering if we could go revisit one of the slides in which you were showing the end of the propagation where the edges were having infinites or empty cases. So you went a little bit, um, like oh, we, yeah. we didn't delve too much into yeah. it. Yeah, this one. So this first and third line, I, I it went too fast for me. 
Yeah, I, I was I was looking at the time, and uh, I was I was thinking maybe I'm uh, talking for too much time, so I decided to step over it. So basically, here it's a it's a self uh, consistent condition that you find in many mean field models. So you define this u here, which is a probability that the outbreak will eventually die out. So if you follow a link, you'll reach a node and maybe a bunch of nodes, but you will not uh, you will not reach uh, like a ever increasing tree. So at some point, the, the like the, the epidemics will run out of people to infect before infecting everybody. And so you're saying, so this probability, if I'm following one edge, then it will be equal to the policy that if I follow that edge, then I'm gonna reach someone who doesn't, who will not infect anybody else. Or you will reach someone that will infect one other person, but that contact won't spark uh, a large scale epidemic. Or you reach someone that will inf infect two people, but then neither of these two will then create like a large scale epidemic and so on. And so, so when you sum up, sorry. No, it's okay, just uh, trying to understand. So this is a little bit like, what are what is the probability that I am on my way to a dead end, pretty much, following? Yeah, me? exactly. Yeah, that's a good okay. way to, uh, okay. to uh, I was confused by the infinite sign for a moment. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay. And then the ones on the bottom is the distribution of all the, um, like the, the whole at the end of the, um, the size of the outbreak, I guess. Yeah, so, so H1 here would be the PGF for the distribution of, si of uh, let's say, tree size of outbreak size if you follow one link. And then following more or less the same, uh, the same argument, you can come up with the same self-consistent equation for this PGF. So instead of it, it being like a, let's say an algebraic equation, then it's a functional equation. So the solution, mm -hmm. the, the solution is a function itself. And then you can solve it with different tools, and then you can uh, obtain the, the PGF for the size distribution. I see. Okay. Um, Let other people ask questions. Uh, I would like to ask a question, yes. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, Thank you very much. Um, I, I, are you aware of any uh, study uh, by people in pharma, Pharmaco pharmacology, uh, they use compartmental uh, model just like you. And I have the impression that uh, their, their analysis could apply, except that uh, instead of having uh, cells, they have people in various situations. You know, they take the bus, they go to the office, they come home, that sort of thing. It's very similar to the compartmental analysis that they do with the spread of uh, of uh, a, a, a remedy or uh, in the body. Do you are you aware of any uh, uh, study? Uh, that? Not that much, I must say. Uh, but I know that these kind of models, if you go back to the math. Uh, it's it's like the type of uh, equations that we get is very typical from like I've seen it in ecology, I've seen it in chemistry, I've seen it in so it's uh, I wouldn't be surprised if something very similar would be used in other uh, other fields. Um, but I uh, I wouldn't be able to tell like say well you should, there's this these studies that people uh, use this kind of approach in uh, uh, pharmacology. Thank you. But I must say, like in, in this talk, I wanted to uh, like promote is not the proper word, but I wanted to to explain why I, I think this like the PGF approach is interesting and why we used it and what we've been able to learn from it. But uh, like I said at the at some point here. Uh, like my point is not to say that these approaches are not good. I'm just saying that they are different set of assumptions. And, and also uh, what I'm not saying is that for instance, in this model here, um, 
this looks like a compartmental model, but they, they use non-Markovian dynamics. So it's changed the way you write down equations and then you can take into account more complex behavior. So there are ways to use these approaches also to, uh, to model uh, infectious diseases or that are similar to COVID-19, but it's just like another set of assumptions and another way to complexify the models. And then you can learn new other stuff. So it, different, different approaches can, uh, inform you about the, the disease in different ways. I have a question. Uh, I thought it was really interesting to see the the, the variance component of the R not like the over dispersers yeah. uh, parameters. So that that's uh, it's really cool. I, and I was wondering um, about the time evolution of this uh, from many aspects. But this maybe the simplest one is when for public health. Um, measures when we are trying to control if we ignore that if we don't know about if we don't know about that dispersion parameter and we're focused on the r naught and we're educating the population we're doing stuff to limit r naught we're probably affecting both right so there is a car there's a correlation between between the two and that does there might be a way to draw a trajectory mm -hmm. uh, when people change their behavior the party animal all of a sudden is is being ghosted because people say, I don't want to get close to that person yeah. because I know that they're important. So is there, is it something that is known quantified the, the covariance between these two, these two axes? Oh, that's a good question. Um, uh, I mean, I've seen it. People are like, when they use these kind of models to evaluate, like to assess the effectiveness of some uh, interventions, um, but I'm not sure if they have like if they I don't I don't I'm, I'm pretty sure people thought about this, but I don't have any like uh, publications, for instance, or studies where people would have had this kind of mechanistic relationship between these two, or maybe not mechanistic, but saying well, when you if you decrease uh, the dispersion, and then like if you if you yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly, but yeah. that's a pretty good question. It, it would be like a double advantage. You, yeah. In other words, you underestimate the benefits if if you just look at the the decrease in the R0 because you don't know that you're also benefiting from yeah. reduction in the over dispersal. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. That's a good question. That's interesting. Yeah. Anyone else? I see that we're uh, that we're a bit over uh, a bit over time. Oh, yeah. The, oh, I, I have a question, a simple question. Uh, thank you so much for an interesting talk. 